What's up, Mzanzi? Welcome to Farmers Inside Track, episode 397. I'm your host, Octavius Pandil. Now, lice infestations are a common issue in cattle farming that can lead to discomfort, decreased productivity, and economic losses if left untreated. While recognizing the signs of lice infestation and implementing effective treatment strategies are crucial for maintaining herd health and welfare. In this episode, Dr. Stefan Stein, Technical and Regulatory Veterinarian at AfriVet, will be sharing their valuable insights to help you choose the right treatment plan for your herd. Dr. Stefan, welcome to Farmers Inside Track. It's absolutely lovely to have you with us. we giving information to farmers about learning about the signs and also potential ways to navigate and implement programs for them to help them. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for, for giving me the opportunity, I must say. It's a pleasure to be able to answer some questions. Thanks. What are the common signs and symptoms of lice infestation in cattle? Well, I think if we if we come back to lice overall, it, it's not something that's difficult to understand. It's an external parasite. The easiest thing to think about if you think about lice is when your kids get lice at school. You know, everybody's up in arms and everybody's kind of comfortable with the fact that lice are external parasites and they're very small. They can infest hosts in, in very large numbers, and that's usually when we start seeing problems. Because they're external parasites and they're living in between their fur and their hair, what you commonly see is that irritability and cattle especially being annoyed, you know, scratching the whole time, just very fidgety. And that's but just because of the, the physical irritation that, that's going on on the skin. And a lot will also depend in terms of the types of lice that we do get, and they do impact the animal in a slightly different way. But the one will cause a much more severe reaction in the animals in terms of the irritation. If you look at the time of year that you usually see, see this, this is usually now late autumn beginning to the winter. And the moment the temperature picks up again, that kind of also disappears. So the animals overall, you know, you'll see those signs typically this time of year and a little bit later maybe. And then, then that starts giving you clues as to what to be watching out for and what to be worried about. If you get severe infestation, you will see a marked drop, you know, in the production parameters that you used to see if they're healthy, the condition will go down, your milk production might go down, things like that. And of course, now with, if you've got like with us as well, if you continually scratch at something the whole time, you know, you can get secondary bacterial infections or fungal infections. So you might actually end up with patches of hair coming off the animal, uh, being broken or actually turning into this flaky mess if it continues unstopped. So. And how can farmers or livestock owners effectively diagnose lice infestation in their cattle? Overall, and cattle men tend to spend time with the animals, so you know they will pick up if there's a little bit of a fidgetiness in the herd with them scratching more, moving towards scratching poles more often or scratching against some of the crypts and things like that. So I do think the you know the herdsmen will actually pick up that something's not lacquer. But overall, if you look at a more scientific type of thing, you will have different areas affected by the two different types of lice. We can maybe talk a little bit about the two different types here, and we can go into a little bit more detail. But you do get two types, your chewing and your biting lice. Your chewing lice tend to prefer the neck and shoulder region, as well as the top line of, of the bovine, and also then around the root of the tail, so that way the tail goes into the body. Preference for sucking lice tends to differ a little bit. So certain species will like certain areas. You'll have one species that loves forming around the shoulder area. And then you've got another species that will go more to the dorsal neck, to the dewlap, and in between the leg, front legs, you know, around the brisket. That's usually where you get out of here. So if you get this hair loss area, it's also not rocket science. You go up to that area where you see there's hair loss and you just slowly comb the hair away and start looking for small little insects. And usually you'll find them, you know, all clump together because they've got a very short life cycle. They actually do procreate quite quickly. So by the time you actually see the skin lesions or the, the lesions in that coat, you know, you will have quite a marked number of these insects sitting around. And if you look at your chewing lice, they tend to have a quite broad head and they've got a reddish color. So they're also called your red lice. These large heads, broad heads, you know, they've got like almost powerful jaws, if you can call that use the animal term directly on insects, and they actually chew pieces of the top layer of skin, and they use that for nourishment. So you can now imagine if you just sit around and all of a sudden something starts chewing into 
for your skin that is highly irritating. You know, so they do tend a much more severe irritation, especially if you've got a bunch of lice feed in the same spot. The second group, both these groups, you know, will have different species within them, but they'll have the same outer appearance. But your second group is your blue lice. And those are the biting lice I spoke about earlier. Those are the guys that actually drink the animal's blood. So they have a very long, sharp head and the mouth parts are, are actually adapted to actually go through the skin into small vessels and then actually suck blood. And I remember when I was a student, I usually got so confused. If something drinks blood, you expect it to be red. And now the blood sucking insect is blue and the non blood sucking one is red. But, but I want to just remind everyone that it just if you, to just give you a little bit of a tip on to how to remember this. If you get like a bad bruise from either kick from a horse or you bump into something, it's red for a short time, but it goes blue very quickly. And that's because the blood actually starts breaking down and those breakdown products tend to be a lot darker than this cherry red that we usually see with leading. So what we're actually seeing is the the insides of these small semi-transparent animals. And that's actually the digested blood that gives it this blue appearance. So that's one way that you can, you know, maybe see, like I said, they're between one and two millimeters big. So if you've got a magnifying glass or you've got your cell phone and and it has that function for a magnifying glass, take a picture. You can ask them for help identifying that insect. You can even take some of those insects, put it in a little bit of surgical spirit and take that with to your vet or your local co-op and ask them to help you identify or sort that out. It always helps to have a pair of eyes to help you identify something like that. If it's too big to be a mite or too small to be a tick, then it's most probably lice. So regarding the specific species of lice that commonly affect cattle, do they differ in the signs and treatment? You do see them in, in different sites, but I mean, the sites don't differ that largely. But the good news is overall, the treatment tends to be similar. The only fall or drawback to the treatment is if you can't really treat the chewing lice with a systemic a parasite, something like your ivermectin families, Afrivet has a, a product called Ecomectin, that won't work for your chewing lice because they never get deep enough into the skin to actually be exposed to that drug. But something like sucking lice, that works brilliantly for sucking lice. Your topical treatments should cover both, but if you want to make 100% sure that you that you cover the chewing lice and the biting lice, then something like for chewing lice, pour on with any of the caricides, your delta methrins, like your delta pour five, your eradictics or the amitraz. That's the type of thing that will kill the, you know, topically kill these, both these species. And then you can use the ecomectin if you see that it is actually blue lice and, and not the red lice. It's always important when, you know, when looking at treatments is you know, once you've got an idea what type of organism it is you're trying to kill is just check your label. Go and make sure that the product that you use is actually registered and a lot of them will specify chewing lice or biting lice or sucking lice. So we tend to forget, we tend to grab something off the shelf, but just check that no matter what you then use, just check the label that it says it's for cattle and it will cover biting lice and chewing lice. And you know, after we training services, we spend a lot of time actually teaching co-op workers the differences and, and how they can help their clients. So don't be shy to, to just ask for help. What are the potential risks or negative impacts of untreated lice infestations on cattle health and productivity? If we don't even look at the welfare aspects of it, if you've spoken to anybody that has had lice, it's a constant battle you're scratching the whole time. So you can imagine that on, on you know, your, your head of cattle the whole time. So if we just take the, you know, that type of, is it ethic to actually have them suffer that amount of irritation and annoyance? Well, then we look at, I mean, an animal that is scratching, you know, is not eating. If you're producing, then it doesn't matter in what, we're always in a battle for energy. So you can remove anything that taps energy from your animal that can be used to produce a product, then you have to treat it. And it's funny, I mean, we, we kind of think oh, it's a short life cycle, you know, it can't last by the end of the winter. So maybe, you know, we, we save on something like that. But there was one study done by Gibney and Collie that found that a heifer could lose almost 100 grams per day on her growth. You know, over a lifetime, that's a bit of kilograms that that heifer never reaches just because she's constantly either busy replacing blood 
healing wounds, scratching, her stress levels are high. And these animals, because it's a winter disease, as well, these animals are already immune suppressed. So they're already struggling. They're under nutritional stress as well, because usually the felt quality goes down and they're struggling to get energy in. And now we want to give energy away to these parasites. You know, overall, it's apart from damage, physical damage to hides and coats and things like that, causing secondary infections, you know, you do lose production. And that could be in the form of weight gain, milk production. Everybody knows you need to raise a calf with milk. So if your heifer at that moment, you know, is new, a first calf heifer, and, you know, and she doesn't have milk for that calf, you struggle. And also your production will suffer. And so if you don't keep that in mind, you know, you will suffer in the long run. If we look again at diseases, we shouldn't forget that these lice can actually also contribute to the spreading of diseases like all sickness or anaplasmosis. So it doesn't seem like a big issue, but once you start counting all these little categories together, your risk goes up quite a bit. So your production can take a big knock. What are some conventional treatment options available for controlling lice infestation in cattle? The normal way to go about it is you can always follow two approaches. You can either follow a prophylactic approach, meaning that you, you prevent the disease before it comes, and then you have a therapeutic approach. So the therapeutic approach you can follow quite easily, but one has to remember because of the short life cycle, we're talking about between 7 and 23 days, you know, these guys can spread through the herd quite quickly, you know, especially if your cattle's under stress. So treatment options might actually be a lot more expensive than actually just the preventative option. So if you look at preventative option, that's usually then your bunch dips or sprays or porons. If you've got sucking lice, you have and like an ivermectin included in that too. And usually treat them this time of you know, going into late autumn, even though it doesn't feel like we're trying to go into autumn. It still feels like it's summer. I think we'll just break into winter the next few weeks. But, um, you know, that's the time where, where you want to prophylactically treat if you've seen this problem before. But a lot of people are actually now treating some of the blue ticks too. So the same treatment helps. So prophylactically, if you've got a good health or a you know, health management plan, that will slot into that, the prophylactic treatment of lice. So the other approach is just to try and keep your animals as healthy and in the best condition that, you know, they can be because the less stress they are under, the more energy they have available for production and actually to stimulate the immune system and not overcrowding. The lice actually spread on a top of nose to nose, you know, contact level. And you can even have some of the flies carry the lice from one bover to another. So that's the type of things that you look out for. But I think, you know, the mainstay treatment is your acaricide, whether that's systemic or dipping, and then a repeat of that within seven to 10 days to make sure you cover that life cycle. Because if we've got, uh, you know, mom listeners, yeah, they know how difficult it is to get rid of head lice, those gnats. It's very difficult to get rid of that eggs. They're, they're impenetrable to, to a lot of the type of chemicals we use. So we actually want to wait for them to hatch and then treat again. So you'll do treatment, repeat 7 to 10 days, and do another repeat 7 to 10 days. But as I said earlier, that does fall within your standard tick plunge dipping regimen. So if you've got your health plan sorted, consulted your veterinarian on what your diseases are, then you should be A for away. Are there any natural or alternative remedies that can be used to manage lice infestation in cattle? The typical scientist answer, I'm sure there are quite a number of home remedies that one can try. There's none that I'm aware of, but that might just be because most people won't share it with me because I'm, you know, I've got more of a scientific approach to it. I think one needs to be very careful when using products that's not registered for the species that you're treating, so for cattle or for the organism that you're trying to kill. There's a reason we have regulatory bodies in South Africa it's not just to make sure that our cows are safe, but it's also to make sure that the food line stays safe, the food supply line stays safe down the line. The registered products used for, for the treatment of external parasites, they go through rigorous testing, re-evaluation, and they test for residues, and they test environmental impact and things like that. So it's very difficult to recommend any product because if I want to recommend a product, I want to recommend a product, a remedy that will work very quickly and sort out the problem for welfare reasons, for the animal's best interest as a veterinarian, 
we swore an oath to make sure that we don't let animals suffer unnecessarily. I'm sure there are remedies out there. And I think in the companion animal scope, I think there's a lot of products registered for alleviating that irritation. But I think that's all adjunctive therapy to the actual killing of the mite. I'd be very careful for alternatives unless it's been proven. Follow the science in that sense. But that's going to be up to the farmer. How frequently should cattle be treated for lice and what are the best practices for preventing reinfestation? Once again, treating them this time of year as we're going into the cooler months because the lice definitely enjoy the cooler months. The eggs also survive longer on the host, on the cattle. That will be form part of the health plan as discussed earlier. What I just want to mention as well is the nice thing is is that you, the life cycle of all the life species actually happen on the host. They don't enjoy being off cattle. So you don't have that rigmarole of now having to disinfect infected camps or areas where they sleep or crawls or things like that because the environment just sorts them out. So that that is at least one good thing you know, to make up for the fact that they can actually, you know, that, that they reproduce quite quickly. Can lice infestation in cattle spread to other livestock or animals on the farm? It's a very good question. I also think that's one of the good things about lice and probably the reason why they don't cause as much trouble as some of the other diseases that are very host specific. So cattle, lice will stick to cattle and not necessarily spread to, to other animals on the farm. You can never say never because we work in biology and in my academic history as told, you know, they don't read textbooks, so you can't say never. But overall, we don't really see cattle blasts on other species. You know, so that's the one thing that kind of, um, you know, also counts in our favor. And finally, in severe cases or outbreaks of lice infestation, are there additional measures or strategies that should be implemented to control the spread and minimize the harm to cattle? Most of the, the damage is caused, are caused by the, the physical irritation of the, the lice on the animal. So if you can immediately remove that in animals that's, that's strong enough, and we're not talking, we're saying in severe cases or outbreaks, I think if the case is so severe that your blood-sucking lice are so numerous that your animals are anemic, basically, you know, very low blood volume and then red blood cells in that sense, um, you know, then you have to kind of, Basically, use triage and decide which ones are suffering unnecessarily and which ones you can pull through. But I think rapid treatment then for those animals that can, you know, stand being being dipped or being injected should be injected as quickly as possible and then repeated seven to ten days later. If you look again on the companion animal side, I think people are a lot more keen to try the shampoos and the oils and the you know nutritional support and things like that. But in a farm setup, you know, just try and kill the lice as quickly as possible. Get them on good quality feed. Help the immune system fight that infection, even that secondary infection. If there's secondary infections, treat those secondary infections. And if it's to a point that, you know, that you're really worried, you know, that's why we have vets. Contact your local vet, your local animal health technician, you know, your state vet, you know, for help in those cases. And, you know, if your vet's willing to help you identify, go buy the drugs from him and support each other in that sense too. The only other thing apart from nutritional support is maybe just make sure that there's space, that the animals, if, if it's in a feedlot system, just check that the space requirements are being kept as prescribed um, you know, by suns. And you can even just lighten the stocking density so it doesn't spread um, as quickly. You know, So there's a lot of the typical biosecurity stuff, separate the sick ones from the healthy ones, keep a physical barrier between them you know, or a physical space between them depending on, on what you've got available. But I think most farmers will opt for treatment and repeat treatment and, and then the problem should be sorted. Thanks so much, Dr. Stefan Stein, Technical and Regulatory Veterinarian at AfriVet. For more on the topic, visit www.foodformzanzi.co.za. And that's a wrap. Remember to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform. From me, Octavius Pandil, our technical producer, Megan Fennerfin, and the rest of hashtag Team Food from Zanzi. Thanks for listening. Life in South Africa can be a lot. I mean, scroll through Twitter for a minute and tell me I'm wrong. Thank God for South Africans though, right? We're inspiring, and even on the bad days, we fight back with a smile. That's why I love Food from Zanzi so much. They're not ashamed to celebrate the ordinary unsung heroes 
who work every day to put food on our nation's tables. Go to foodformzanzi.co.za and never miss an inspiring story.